all for coming out, and I want to say thank you, too, to those who are watching online. My name is Rachel Goldberg, and I'm the Programs Coordinator at the Manassas Museum, and we so appreciate you coming out for our front porch talk today. Um, just a little plug for other programs that are happening at Liberia House. Next Friday, we'll uh, be having the final uh, film in our Summer African American Film Festival, um, and we're, we're rounding it out with Selma, so you can join us next Friday at 7.30. It's free, but we require reservations online so that we can social distance, so just uh, make your reservations online at manassasechoes.com. Um, we are not amplified with sound today, so I hope everybody can hear. If you're back there in the back and you want to hear better, please feel forward to move, or please feel free to move forward. Just maintain social distance. Um, if there are empty chairs, you know, you know the dance. Um, so without further ado, we have about an hour for our front porch talk today. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our amazing speakers today. I got the invitation to ask the questions today, but I'm thankful for it and uh, and looking forward to being the, the chief listener among us uh, to hear you all tell some of your stories. So uh, we want to hear from you. So would you take a moment to introduce yourself a little more and to tell your connection to, to this particular place? Because it's a special thing to be on this ground with both of you. So uh, maybe you can go first and tell us a little bit more about yourself and, with, what, and explain again your connection to this place. So good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm glad to see all these beautiful faces. So I, my name is Linnell Naylor, and I am a descendant of Samuel and Nellie Naylor. I am, uh, they are considered my fourth time great grandparents. They came to the Liberia House in 1820, coming from Fairfax County, which they called, considered Prince William County at that point in time. Um, they came here in 1820 with their enslavers, which was William Ware and Harriet Bladen Mitchell Ware. So, I'm here representing my ancestors. Thank you. How about you? Uh, my name is Colleen Blessing. Robert King Carter is my eighth great grandfather. I come down from um, Elizabeth Carter and Nathaniel Burrell. So just a, a, a quick two sentence summary. Robert King Carter um, was very, very wealthy. When he died, he had, he was, he was, people said he was the richest man in the colony. He had lots of land, lots of money, and lots of enslaved people. When he, when he was um, in his prime, uh, he was the land agent for Lord Fairfax. Lord Fairfax was still over in England. So uh, Carter was doing things for uh, Fairfax, but he was also doing things for Carter. He ended up getting many, many thousands of acres, first kind of in the northern neck, and the Rappahannock and then between the Rappahannock and the James. But then he started to spread out and his, his, his surveyors ended up um, finding the best land for him. <laughs> and, and so he amassed a huge amount of land and uh, his, uh, Prince William historian recently told me that because of primogenitor, which is, means that the oldest son or the oldest children get the, the best land, so many children and so many other relatives who he, he, he ended up moving north um, and so some of the next generation had land for, for example um, um, up for the um, um, Liberia house and maybe then even the next year Oakland um, so he, he this was sort of the, 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 the next generation and I'm going to kind of skip ahead to some of the questions but Robert King Carter died in 1732 so he would never 
never have been to this house, for example, because this house was, um, was belonged to his granddaughter. But he must have ridden his horse through here, I think, because he had compromise up in, in, in near uh, in Manassas. When you see his compromise boat, frying pan boat, that's all Robert King Carter. So he was probably coming up and down the northern end. But he, so my connection to this place is that my eighth great grandfather bought, bought the land. And you've both done a lot of research. Uh, you know enough that I'm curious, as you imagine your ancestors here, uh, how do you tell us about how you imagine them? So, I'll take with, the picture. Me, with, with me imagine my ancestors here, it has to be a little bit of cre creativity in mind. Of course. So, you know, even while I'm sitting here, I can visualize them working on the land, plowing the soil, taking care of the families, you know, even trying to take care of their families as well. But before all of that, they came from Africa. And I visualized, because this is the way I want to see them, I visualized them as kings and queens, as warriors and rebels. Because they had to have that innate spirit in them in order to thrive through this, I'm going to call it an illness called slavery. So that's the only way they made it, is to have that, you know, that, that consciousness and, and that uh, pride in order for them to make it through. Because they knew the importance of being a human being. Thank you. Um, you two have had multiple conversations and built up yeah, um, quite a friendship. And I wonder about uh, how you two got connected and tell a little bit of that story. Well, I'll start start now. <laughs> so so um, I, I saw a, a, a lecture in the Fairfax Library program, I don't know, before COVID. Uh, about um, black midwifery. It was it was a, a talk given by a graduate student at George, um, George Mason, and I was sitting in the standing room only. Packed. It was so fascinating. I was sitting kind of in the middle of the back, and, and I didn't see everybody. And all of a sudden, in the question, the questions and answers, <laughs> she raises her hand <laughs> and says something like, "Well, I'm a descendant of the Carter family." You know, I catch my breath and I turn to my, my the, the friend that I came with and I say, oh my gosh, she's my cousin, she's my cousin, I have to go meet her. Yeah. And so the minute the, 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 the formal talk was over, I went up and we started back and forth and about who are you from and I know that I have a lot of black ancestors and I'm very proud of that, but I had never met anybody, I had not met one. So that was very exciting. What were you thinking? So, of course, when I look at people, I don't see color. So if I want to approach somebody or ask a question, of course, if you can't ask me this, I'm all for it. So that's why I asked that question and I represented myself as being a descendant of the Carter family because that's who I am. It showed up in my DNA. So there's nothing to hide about that. But when I met her, I said, hey, Ms. Madison, I was like, you know, we need to talk. So I had an event, we had our little conversation, I had an event in February, and I was like, Colleen, it'll Here. be a blessing. Listen to that. Colleen, it will be a blessing. Blessing. Is blessing. Yeah, blessing. <laughs> yeah. If you could attend the event that I'm having in February, and we had it here, this is the first event, you know, kind of acknowledging our African ancestors. And she did a wonderful presentation about her family, which was very intriguing, because, you know, to read it in the book and to actually hear like a descendant talk, like an actual physical person, that's a blessing within itself. So that's how we met, and we are continuing to be family and friends today. That's great. So as you uh, as you studied your ancestors, what what are some things that have uh, surprised you or um, or captivated you? That uh, what do, what do you remember? Is there a moment or something you remember noticing that that really caught your eye or, or captivated you? How much time do you have? Okay, <laughs> okay. I, I know. I was going to say because I have one. Yeah, too. you have one. Okay, go ahead. Go. Well, oh, okay, so the thing, and this, this is um, actually not, uh, uh, um, it, it, my Carter line and my other line all go back, my, my family's been here since, since Jamestown, um, and the thing that captivated me the most, my, my maiden name is Cornette, and I discovered um, a court case, that, and I know all of my family out in, in the very, very, uh, Grayson County, the very, very western part of, of Virginia, um, they were enslavers, some of them, uh, just a few, but uh, one of my, so I figured out it's my fifth great uncle um, had, my fifth great uncle was 
married to was white. He was married to a white lady. They never had any children. They had one um, um, enslaved person, a female, and then they had three mulatto children. And there was some talk in the town, and, and, and you know, we know what happened. Um, he decided that he wanted to free his slaves, and um, well, for his enslaved people. And, uh, the, and I just wanted to read something real quick because it's just so scary. And this is what this is what complicates history. Is um, out out in Western Virginia in, in 1851, the Committee of Vigilance of the county, who numbered nearly 200, had John Cornett, that's my my uncle, a citizen, a friend, and a backer of Bacon, not Nathaniel Bacon, but another Bacon who was preaching abolition. Um, they required him, my, my great uncle, to uh, renounce abolition and promise obedience to the laws. He refused. So what do you think happened to him? He's out in Virginia. It's illegal to, to free your slaves. The rod was brought, one, two, three, and on to twelve on the bare back at each end. Then he cried out and promised and said that he would sell and he would leave. Now he ended up not doing that. Uh, there were some court things here and there. He ended up um, freeing his enslaved people. Um, they moved to Ohio. And when one of his enslaved um, sons died uh, on the birth certificate, it was listed as father, it was listed as my great, uh, my, my fifth great uncle. So that's that's just, that, that I just read this very recently. I knew that there was someone who was punished for trying to free their slaves. But it, it was easy to think, oh, if I were back there, but it wasn't that easy. And I'm, I'm not going to say that he did, he was an enslaver, and I, he did enslave people, but he, but he, when he tried to do the right thing, and it was a Methodist minister that got the bug in his head about abolition, um, it, it didn't go, he was, I'm sure he hated the town, and there were, the, the town was lousy with Cornets, it's just Cornets everywhere. I never saw that name so much as right there. So that, that's just one little peek into history about what, you know, you might think, oh, I know what I would do if I were back then, but, you know, there, there were consequences and it was scary. So what, I'm curious about, like, what that made you feel when you were, when you're uh, uh, learning these stories and uh, uh, okay. uncovering these, these well, things. I feel very, I feel very close to him and because his name, last name is Cornette, and I was raised with Cornette, so I mean, it, I just go right back, just right up the line. My husband's from Ohio. I know that um, people. Uh, I mean, I'm. I'm not. I'm not happy to say that that he was. Can an you hold it? Can you hold it? Thank you. Yeah. I'm not happy to say that he was an enslaver, but I'm happy to say. I'm just really happy to see that he tried to free the, to free the people that were ultimately his his um, liaison and his and his children. Um, but it was enough that I wanted to tell it today because it just really affected me a lot. And it personalizes history in a way that you don't see in the history books. Even when you see freeing your slaves is illegal in, in wherever it was, um, about this amount of time, this is an exact, and actually Harriet Beecher Stowe, after she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, wrote another book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and I'm not gonna read the, the, the stuff that, the reason I know that all this stuff is true, which I have to read because apparently John Cornett's um, experience was one of the things she used to um, uh, do document that this is really how people were treated. So I have more research than needed, as they say. Thank you. Uh, I don't think I need a mic. I have a, you know, I, I'm good. <laughs> so. Colleen, it's yours. That's, I mean, that's your designated mic. Thank you. Yep. Okay, okay, totally. Good. So anyway, um, with that question that you asked, so I am proud to say that my ancestor, Samuel Neal, purchased his land around 1850. Um, and then, no, I'm sorry, purchased his freedom around 1850, and he purchased land from Wimware in 1865, $500 for 50 acres, which is a lot of land back then. I can't even save $100. Mind you, <laughs> he was able to save $500, but we have to, we have to realize what his goal was. His goal was to achieve land, and once you achieve land as an African American living in Manassas Park, Prince William County, that gave you prestige. So he had prestige. So when he probably walked down to the store, there, hey, Samuel Miller, that's the free man mm -hmm. that owns 50 acres of land. He was a slave of when, where, of when, where. However, the downfall is his wife was still enslaved. Mm -hmm. 
her children were still enslaved. So you can imagine some of the tension around the area that, you know, in, in the relationship, I, I'm just guessing that there may have been some tension that my dad is free, but we don't have the same, you know, goings and comings as he does. But I think he was well respected because he respected himself. And with that, his family was respected even so they weren't free, but they still had that connection to him as being, you know, a free person of color in this area. So, and another thing with my research, and I, this all brings us together back in the circle, is that what you mentioned is that in 1870, when I started doing my research, um, 1870, the census, all of the nailers, even Samuel and Nellie, are listed as mulattoes. Hmm. They didn't come here as mulattoes. <laughs> so that, it doesn't take a rocket hmm. scientist to figure out that the reason why they mulatto because there was some relations going on. Yeah. So, you know, there are many things that I have, you know, I, I found, but we have to set another date and time for that. <laughs> but those are the main things that I, I found. But I, I do want to say, all, throughout my research, it wasn't, maybe it wasn't written, but none of them was mistreated. And there is something very special about my nail and lineage in this Liberia house that they actually stayed here and they were well respected. So I'm putting two and two together is that there was a deeper connection to that Naylor family, to the Ware family, and to the Carter family. Mm. That out of all the enslaved people that ran away, they stayed. Who's modeled on the common practice? I don't know. I'm still learning. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I. I I don't know, but I'm just saying for them to stay here, despite everything they may have went through, it tells me a lot about who they are and who they were connected to. We all know about Alice. Yeah, well, yes, yes. Yes, but for me to see it, and you, you know, they didn't see it until later, but for me to actually see it on paper, and they were, you know, pretty much, Know, the labor knew, okay, the census came along and said, wait a minute, a lot of people. Yeah, in the census, they were listed as black or mulatto. So the 24 year old mom was black, and then yeah. the, the kids were mulatto, mulatto, mulatto. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That was, that was, it was very clear. They, they, they didn't just say, oh, they're lighter or whatever. That's it, right. The, they yeah. needed to d delineate what was going on. There. Right. So I wouldn't have passed as mulatto. I wouldn't have right. passed. My daughter said no. You're right. No. I wouldn't pass it. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Pass. I wouldn't pass it. Yeah. However, my aunt, my father's paternal, my father's sister, very fair skinned she would have passed as mulatto. So it's clear that you spent, uh, you both spent time with your ancestors, uh, both in the facts that you found in, and just spending time with them as people, as, uh, as. A, a connection to your to your past, right. so, mm -hmm. uh, and and I honor that, and that's a beautiful thing for you to share with us. And thank you. Um, what what other kind of emotions has has it brought you through uh, to as you're doing that research? Some of your reactions to getting to know their story. And well, well, I was thinking uh, we're probably just mixing up all the questions. Yeah, here. we're. But I, <laughs> we're but that's a flower. But, but I was thinking I got kind of a gimpy arm here because I wanted I want to do this. I'm thinking, and you guys might have thought of this too. I would, I would love to have, have been able to t go back and tell them DNA is going to have eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right? So all this mess and around, what, what you call it? Relation, relations? Relations. I call it relations. All, all, yeah. this, all these relations, all of a sudden, people like me, people like Linnell, we, it, it, and now obviously the census taker said mulatto, but no, but, and there, were, there was obviously in my uh, great uncle's case, um, talk of the town. But that, well, like you said, it was. I think it was fairly common. Uh, but DNA, DNA doesn't lie, as as, as Henry Louis Gates said, and DNA is going to tell the story. So now we're finding out more than we were able to, to find out before. Yeah. And I actually, you know, on that line, I truly believe. Now maybe I'm a little, you know, up in the air with my thinking, but I truly believe that they want to be found. They want to. They want to be reconnected. They want to be. Um, what I, forgiven. But recognized. Recognized yeah. and forgiven. Yeah. And I, when I yeah. say forgiven, I mean yeah. also the European ancestors. You know, because mm -hmm. in that, like you mentioned before, in that day and time, in that period in time, colonial time, you did what your others did. 
If they, if your ancestors owned slaves, nine times out of ten, you're gonna own slaves. But that was that was the protocol then. Mm -hmm. So I think they want us to connect. That's why we are here today, because they want to be found, they want to be respected, and they want to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. So I I gotta know how you got there, because that's a <laughs> that, that's a more uh, gracious and um, and humanizing view. Yeah. Uh, than we often hear and see. So I'm wondering, um, where does that, where does that level of grace and forgiveness come from for you? How did, how did you get there? How did I get there? Because you could have nothing but contempt. I did in the beginning, but however, my relationship with God, and I know that for me to continue to research my family with an open heart, mind, and spirit, that I had to let that go. I couldn't go through the history books. I can't go to the library with this girl. Oh, oh my God, this person mistreated them, this person mistreated them. So I had to let it go. Because if I didn't, it would hinder me from finding my ancestors or to finding people like you. Because I, I couldn't approach her if I had that in my heart, in my spirit. I, have, I don't, I don't want to talk to her. Yeah. Look how her ancestors mistreated me. So I had to have a whole different mindset when I do this research, when I approach people, even when I, I share with my family. You know, my daughters, they're really not into it. I did encourage them, not force them. I encouraged them to do their DNA test so they can have a connection to me and to their other ancestors and they can know who they are. So I cannot go into anything when it comes to genealogy, African American genealogy, I cannot go in there with a heavy spirit or I would not be successful. They would not come through. Well, and it seems like to me that connects with the kind of resilience that you see in your ancestors themselves. It's like that's that's part of what has uh, kept you strong and, and moving forward is your ability to Absolutely. have an open heart. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. You're that. welcome. Well, and and I'm I'm feeling since I'm on the I'm on the bad side here. Yeah, I'm a bad side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and people did live in their time, and um, it's it it's it's impossible to say. Uh, they they I could I should, if I went back I could tell them to live differently. Although we do have. Um, well, I, RC3, um, Robert Carter III, the great emancipator. And so there were people, yay. Yeah, yeah, my family was a part of that. Yeah, rock star, yes, rock star. Yes. Well, and he, and he was, wasn't like, well, he was my uncle. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Well, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, so for yeah. those of us that don't that don't know oh, all sorry. that, tell a little bit of that story. Yeah, go ahead, Colin. Well, go well, go well go. you probably know better than I do. No, you. Um, <laughs> no, I don't know the dates. So I, I believe eight, it was 1850. Don't quote me, Facebook. <laughs> but I believe it was like 17. 1791. Oh, 17, yeah. 1790 something. Yeah, that, that um, uh, you guys can all help me. Um, he decided to manumute, manumute his slaves um, over a period of time. Not, not. He just didn't say all are free, go, go. Um, and I think there were different periods of time for different people. And then, and I think there were a few that were not, that were right. not um, um, free. Right. But that was. Um, I don't know, is heretical the right word? I mean, who did that? Who did that? And I'm assuming that a number of people, the Carters and yeah, the family, yeah. my other aunts and uncles and all of them, were probably like, what are you doing? Yeah. Because that, that, was, that was a great source of wealth. I think I read recently that the, the, the largest source of wealth in the South at some point was enslaved right, people. Right. It wasn't land, it wasn't money, it wasn't cotton, it was enslaved people. So to be 500, 500 and something, I think, was the number. Um, and that was, so So I guess it, it, there is a possibility that you could have people that were, what is it, enlightened, more feeling. That's what more, I was gonna more, say. More, more, yeah. more yeah. forward thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, there, but, but the preponderance of the of people were, I think, were not like that, either because they knew that their daddy and their great dad, granddaddy didn't live like that, or, or, like my uncle here, he, they might have taken him to the town hall, and um, they actually, I thought lynch, lynching someone meant to kill someone, but they, they, the court record said that he was lynched. He didn't die, right. but they- It was they, a force of intimidation. They beat him up, <laughs> they beat him up. So I, I, don't, I, I don't know if I would be brave enough. I don't know, I, I would be scared. Well, with that being said, I'm just gonna put it lightly and shortly. I think with him wanting to do that to free his enslaved, is that he had a, I read somewhere that he had a great awakening, that he he encountered a friend, a good friend of his was like, hey, you know, you, you're saying that you're this person of prestige and 
you had this relationship with God, why do you have enslaved people? And I think that inspired, encouraged and inspired him to say, hey, I can't say one thing and then I do another. So I think that's part of it. Well, and I know, I mean, just from, um, I go to the United Methodist Church, and we've been doing a lot of studying of social justice, and there are places in the Bible that people can point to and say that God has said that slavery is okay. Right, so, it's worth mentioning that the... the, the you, you could talk about right, that. Right, so <laughs> it's worth mentioning that folks who believe that people with dark skin were supposed to be enslaved yeah. got that from the church. Uh, yes. And it's a marriage of, of church power and state power that wrote that narrative, but uh, but it's... It's, to be honest, it's both the church that sent that message and the church that preaches this message of grace and forgiveness even for the worst of sins. So, uh, and, and so then, and again, then, that's and true. Then, and then here you are. Nice. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so now let's talk about today when we're in a moment, uh, another moment in our nation's history, uh, in, even locally where there's conversation about uh, the history of slavery, uh, the present state of racism, uh, everything's hot and politicized uh, and intense, uh, people are in the streets. Uh, I'm curious about what your research uh, gives you in that kind of conversation. If, you, if you're in those kinds of conversations today, what is it that your research um, makes you want to get across in, in a conversation? Because we're all, I mean, Thanksgiving's coming. We're all going to be having those kinds of conversations with friends and family. Uh, and I'm curious, in that kind of a conversation, so what do you try to get across based on what you've learned? Should I go? Go ahead. <laughs> you, want, you want to go? No, I was going to say, um, I can go. Um, I was going to say that... I have an answer. <laughs> in today's social life, the reason why we keep going around in cycles is because we are not healing from slavery. We still have this bandage on us. And every time we take the bandage off, we still bleed because we are not healing. With that being said, we need to come together. And I know I'm not going to say, oh, now we're going to come together and keep you by y'all. No, it's not going to be that easy. We need to come together and we need to push, we need to push our personal feelings aside. And we are dealing with things now, racial in inequality. We're still dealing with, you know, people are not getting the proper education. We still have a problem with um, uh, housing. You know, people are not able to afford housing. We still, even still have a problem with health care and health insurance. You know, so those are the, some of the things that when you come around your table for Thanksgiving, those are some of the things that you need to discuss. And with that being said, even when I do my research, some of those things that we're dealing with today, we still dealing with from 1619. We've moved on to the Civil War. Still dealing with that. Then we move on to the Jim Crow laws. We're going up another step, we're moving on to this. So that the social climate is because we are not taking care of slavery, we're not acknowledging slavery that it actually happened. So that's why we still keep continue to go around this cycle. I hope y'all answered your question without you know, going off key, but you know, that's pretty much what it is. It's like an infection that's not healing because it's something innate in us that we don't want to heal. If some of us are comfortable, we're feeling that way. So, so um, in, in a Sunday school class at um, St. Matthew's United Methodist Church, we have been studying social justice for quite a while, and we read, we started out um, reading Just Mercy and, and, and discussed, you know, a couple chapters every week. Then we listened to the podcast Seeing White, which I absolutely, Seeing White, which I highly recommend. Um, then we read um, How to Be an Anti-Racist by um, Ibram X. Kendi, and now we're reading Cast, and oh my gosh, Cast, it's like that, that book is by um, um, Isabel um, Nickerson? Nickerson, Nickerson, yeah, that's just blowing me away. So I'm thinking from my point of view, um, so um, we have, we've had a couple of guest speakers, but everybody in my particular Sunday school class is white. And we're all, and we're all saying, did you know that? Tulsa. Who knew about Tulsa? Well, you know, we learned about it about two weeks before everybody else did. <laughs> did you know that? Did you know that? And we, we've started to say, what we learned in our history class was, and my dad was a history teacher, we didn't learn this stuff. So what I'm trying to do, and we're all trying to do, is educate ourselves 
and I, I have a perspective of being a descendant of enslavers, um, but thinking about how this country has um, not been honest, I think, and, and um, looked at the issues head on, and not taught it to us. And so here we are, 40s, 50s, 60 year old people in Sunday school class saying, I, we knew the basic, you know, reconstruction and Ku Klux Klan, some of that, but we didn't know the real history. So we are trying to do deep, 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 deep dive. Um, and, then, and then every Sunday we do a couple of chapters and we talk about what it was like when W.T. Woodson High School was integrated and what it was like when Luther Jackson was the only place that black people could go. And I, there's so much, those are schools right around me. And I'm like, what? So it, 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 how, it just, I'm just calling everyone to just read and learn and absorb, um, whether you were an enslaver or not, or a white not enslaver or an enslaved person. It's just to understand, and I think once you understand the history, it's exactly what, what Linnell says, we have not solved the problem. We have come to accept the problem. I think we've come to accept the way things are. And then they flare up every once in a while and then it gets put down and, and then it comes, we get, back up and it comes back up again. Yeah. Well, and both of you, it sounds like uh, what you're sharing with us is uh, is your learning. And what you're saying is that there's always more to learn. And, always. Uh, and so that's, of course, one reason why we're grateful for stuff like this, that, so that I and others can, uh, can learn from you. So thank you. Um, I'm curious about your advice to other folks who might be just beginning or just considering looking into their own uh, history um, as individuals or as institutions. So the church that I serve has a building on its campus. The, the land for our church was given to us by the Johnson family uh, who owned a dairy farm. And uh, there's a building on our campus that's contemporary with this building that was a slave cabin. Uh, and it's still there. We think it may be the oldest standing building in Manassas. Uh, and, uh, and so we've got that on our site and uh, I'm new. And so I'm kind of still figuring out what does it mean for us as a church to have that um, here and now a part of our story. Uh, so to folks that are, or institutions that are now looking back to learn, um, I'll, I'll confess that there's some trepidation about it. Uh, what am I gonna find? How am I going to feel about it? Do I have to defend my ancestors, or do I have to accept my ancestors as they are, or, or what? What advice do you have for us? It could be practical, it could be different, but for, for folks that are looking back. That was such a great question. When I look at that, I bet everybody could answer that. But anybody who's spit in the tube it can answer that question. <laughs> That's a DNA reference, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> or swab the cheek, but I did, I did two spits in the tube. Um, you have no idea what you're going to find. And and it, it, it's going to be, it's it, it's it's interesting, it's, it could be upsetting, it could be, you might think, oh, it, I, I don't know. I think there, somebody just recently, you probably know, uh, last name is Bell, he just wrote a book about the Ku Klux Klan and how it was much more active. Anybody know that? His last name is Bell, author Bell. Anyway, um, and he, you, you, he's calculated that how many people were there in the Ku Klux Klan that he went down some generations, and I think he said probably, anybody remember in the audience, one in four people, or one in two people, and you think, and I bet there are many, many people in this country that said, I, I never had anything to do with slavery. I never had anything to do with the Ku Klux Klan. And you'd be surprised. I, I was surprised both uh, positively and I, I wasn't negatively surprised about Robert Key Carter. It was, it, it was very interesting that I, I have someone who is such a founding father of the United States, regardless of this other stuff. But you, you, you have to go into it. I'm, I'm reading a book right now called The Lost Family. And you, you have to be prepared for the good and the bad. It's not just, oh, we're going to find out Aunt Sally's, you know, whatever it is. You, you might find out know that your mom isn't your mom or your dad isn't your dad or you know scary things so you have to or or your great great uncle was a I don't know an enslaver or a Ku Klux Klan person something and you have to be prepared for that so I, I agree with you I like the word trepidation it's not not just like oh I'm gonna get a family tree this is gonna be great yeah there's gonna be different kinds of leaves on that tree and you have to be prepared for all of that so the whoopsie of that side is that 
there are a lot of European ancestors that have African DNA in them. Now, I always know because when I go on my ancestry and I look at the pictures, the pictures are not there. But when I go to the ethnicity, you see a little bit of that Nigerian or you see some Cameroonian. So that's a shock within itself. So a lot of people are saying, I'm going to pick back on what you're saying, you're going to have to be able to face all these emotions. You're going to have some anger. You're going to have some hatred. You're going to have some surprises to learn that some of the, you know, your parents may not be your father, your mother may not be your mother, your aunt may not be your aunt. These are things that you're going to have to encounter. So I always tell people, because I, I think I spit in the tube too, I can't remember. <laughs> but before you, before you make that transition, before you make that transition, before you do that, make sure that you emotionally prepare for the outcome, for the result, because it could be... Um, a little shock, a little culture shock in, in some of the words. Single drop of blood. Loss. Single drop of blood loss. That one drop rule. That's right. Or, um, on the other hand, um, I had a dentist ask me if I had um, Asian ancestors, and that was before spitting in the tube. Right. And I said, I, I didn't know. And he said, the way your top teeth are, the only people that have top teeth form like that came have, have ancestors that came across the land bridge. And I went, Really? Oh, I can't wait. I, didn't. I was told the same thing. My nose. What? That is not a black person's nose. And I'm like, what? What the hell does a black person nose? It's shaped differently. So when I smell, I have a point. And you and you hope that you would get like, yeah. And I and I got and I got nothing. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Uh, so. So then you might, yeah, or you might go in, maybe your, your aunt or, or your uncle or something said, you know, you're related to Abraham Lincoln or you're, you know, you're related to George Washington. And then you're going to go in there digging in and you're going, where did, or, the, I mean, the biggest kind of fouls, what? The misconception. Misconception with, yeah. with DNA is that every, every, every single person here probably thinks they have Native American. Native American. Every, I was waiting on my Native American DNA. Well, I, well. <laughs> Well, I do. I do have court records yeah, yeah. that said I w I, that, that one of my great great grandfathers was part Sabani. Okay. So, but but that didn't come out in my no it didn't, on, it didn't come on out. my pie chart. No, I no. didn't I didn't get any. So I'm thinking, okay, I didn't come across well. They're coming across the land bridge and having this the, the Indian would be the kind of the same thing. I, I came up empty. So yeah, be careful that you say I'm going to prove that I, I go back Native to George American, Washington yes, or yeah. I'm Native American because yeah. it. I mean, you might it might be great and you might you might get it, but. I, I was I was disappointed about that. Yeah. But let me just say this. The ad mixture changed the game. So I know that my different six um different six time grandparents may all know that they were European, right? But once my mother's DNA comes in and then my father's DNA comes in, that changed the whole gamut of the result. So there may be some Native American in me and you say there's a Native American in you. But once those DNA get together and the, the, the paternal side and maternal side, that changes everything. Yeah, have you guys seen the, the, the they, they take like a little colored Legos or colored blocks and they have all the, the blue and the green and the red way back here. And then, and then they go down and they show how within three or four generations, something that was fairly strong can, I'm calling it edit, it could just be edited out. Uh, so, um, and then the, the other, the other I, thing I've read about the DNA testing with with um, Native Americans is not very many Native Americans have been tested. So there aren't very many people in the database. So so, so I'm still holding out hope here, guys, that I can, yeah. my, my son, somebody I, I came across the it, land, somebody <laughs> came across the land bridge, but I couldn't, my pie chart didn't come out like 24% Native American, it came out zero. Yeah. Um, Uh, we've got a couple minutes that I, I would just ask if there's anybody who's got a question from the audience. Great. Yeah. I don't have a question. I just want to say a comment. Even though I'm technically the legitimate daughter of the sailor. I just want to say thank you for this opportunity because as a young person, it, it's really refreshing to hear stories like this because you're right, we don't get that in history books. So to be able to sit amongst those before me is a gracious experience. I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. You're your mother's daughter. <laughs> Bless your heart. Yes, sir. I got a side question. What church with the old building? Is that Grace Methodist? Or yeah, Grace United Grace Methodist. Methodist. Yeah. Okay, I'm curious about that. And then what ancestry or what databases do you recommend? Or did you hit all of them? Well, listen, ancestry is not paying me that, but ancestry is not paying me to say this. You're speaking to the microphone. <laughs> you wouldn't stop 
from the no, 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 no. <laughs> I recommend Ancestry's not paying me to say this, but I recommend you to choose the best DNA test company that you can get. Okay. Well, but Ancestry's not paying me. And, okay. And, okay. <laughs> and I mean, I, I'm not an expert, but I feel like 20. I, I've tested with 23andMe and Ancestry, and 23 is more about the health issues and and um, I don't know how long your fingers are and yeah, whether, yeah. whether you're affected by sounds and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's very interesting. But Ancestry, oh, the other thing I had to warn people about, anybody in the audience who does, does genealogy knows that, that I'm telling you the truth. It will, it will suck your time away. <laughs> to, 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 you got no life left. No life. Look at her. Look at no her. No life. No life. No life. No life. Yeah. No life. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. When you start, when you start looking, especially on, for ancestry, and ancestry for all the, there are criticisms of, of ancestry. Um, they keep giving you new tools and new tools, and every time they give you a new tool, there's like through lines, and through lines wasn't very good, and the through lines got better, and I can't even look at all that stuff. That's how I found my car is through the through lines. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna ask like more clarification on the statement. Um, your mother could not be your mother, your father could not be your father. Because when you do the DNA test, then once those results come back, like for example, my daughter and I. I did the DNA test first, and then my daughter did it. So it shows that I'm her mother, and I know she was proud to know that I'm her mother, oh, right? <laughs> so, yeah. with that being said, <laughs> okay, so the only way you would know that is your mother or your father did the DNA eyes. test, right? Okay. So if you ask them to do it, oh. and they reluctant, don't push them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 In the back, yes, sir? The question was if there are any question. nailers, any Good members question. of the nailer family buried here? Good question. You want to answer that? Yeah. You want to answer Me? that? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm Tony. I work at the Manassas Park Community Center uh, with Hannah here. And um, we have a, a small cemetery that is located in front of the community center. And it's been there forever. And just about a month ago, we found out that that cemetery actually belongs to Samuel and Nelly Nailer. Oh, yeah. uh, Hannah did some work here, and for the last month we got connected. And um, so, yeah, we know for sure that there are some nailers over at the community center in Manassas Park. Um, I can't speak for the grounds over here, though. Right, so the reason why the nailers are buried over there, I call it their resting place. I don't call it the cemetery. But the reason why they are over there, because that was part of the land that Samuel Naylor purchased. That's what I was curious In Manassas about. Park. And so, when they, most of the time when they bury them, they buried them behind their home or in land that they already own. That way they don't have to pay anyone else. The question was about the, the difference between the question of how much black or white blood you have versus race as a social construct or, or something that's, uh, that's not real, but that's applied. I guess that's more for you. Um, I, I, I think mine came out, you know, I'm mostly English and Irish and Scottish and a little bit of, of Scandinavian, a little bit, you know, if anybody who's, you know, just, it, except for the land bridge thing and the, the um, um, it, it came out as I expected. Um, I didn't, and I, I knew that I had deep roots in Virginia, but I didn't know they, they went back to 16, you know, 25 or something. I had people here early, um, but I, but I, I, I didn't come, uh, I didn't go in with any preconceived notions, and I wasn't really shocked at what I, I wasn't shocked at what I found. So, with that, my aunt is not able to be here today, but 
I was always curious about my family's hue, their complexion. So you have me, Miss Brownie, and then I have my father's aunt that's very fair skinned. They never really talked about it, but they kind of did. So I have a cousin, my first cousin with freckles, beautiful red hair. And I was like, mm -hmm. and we're very close. We never treated any, we never treated each other differently because we love each other. But I was always curious as to why she was, they were that complexion and I was this complexion. So of course, when DNA came out, I said, it's time for me to open up Pandora's box. So once I open up, once I do the DNA test, I open up Pandora's box. And when I open up Pandora's box, my aunt did mention to me that we had some Irish. My grandmother mentioned to me Irish from Fairfax County. Like, you know how you young, you're like, Grandma, I don't have time for that conversation. <laughs> but now I wish my grandmother was here because I would confirm everything she told me that she was Irish, she connects to the Murray family, she connects to Alice Haley, all of those things she told me were absolutely true. So that's a whole nother family I'm dealing with because on my DNA chart, they had the pie chart on ancestry, which is wonderful, y'all, because I'm such a visual learner. When you look at the chart, it tells you exactly where your ancestors are from. So I have Scotland, Northern Ireland, and then underneath I have Wales. That confirms my European DNA. Then I have, I have the 33% Nigeria, but then I have the other. So that's what I'm talking about, add mixture. So to, make, to answer your question, the reason why I'm at this point now is because I was curious about the beautiful complexion that my family has. So that's why, you know, that's why we're here now. What I percent? hope I answered your question. Did I answer? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Well, no, what, what percent um, um, European did you come out with? 20%. Compared? 20 compared to your light skin or and so my aunt, that's a good question. I need to look at her chart. I believe that her, her Nigerian was like 33%, but she also had some Iberian. We know who came from Iberian. Uh -huh. And she also had another one, another one that I never heard of. So she's picking up from her father and her mother, which is my grandparents. I'm picking up from my mother and, and it, father. It's the M&M's. That's up right. Yeah. And she got a lot of the what the blue ones. Yeah. She got a lot of the yellow ones. Yeah. I got I got the brown ones. It, well, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's weird. Yeah. And a lot of people will say, well, all my ancestors were Italian, so I have to be 100% Italian, and nope. it does not work that way. Everything and, started in Africa. Exactly. We're all Everything, we're, we're all, all coming from the motherland. That's one thing that also would help us with this social climate. Right. We are all coming from Africa. So the misconception that we had that all of us are coming from Europe and we all 100% European, or we all 100% Scotland or Irish, we are all coming from Africa. Well, in the human genome project that they finally mapped the human genome, Miss Lucy. 99.9% nine, mm -hmm. of our DNA is exactly the same. That's right. So it's not like there were two atoms in each. No. Bio, what is it called? Bio DNA? Oh, you go ahead. <laughs> well, some I, I think there are, I've heard, learned in my Sunday school class, some people think there was a white Adam and Eve, and a, then there was a black Adam and Eve. That, and it's called. That's crazy. That's what the division comes right there. Yeah, that's yeah. The and, and the Human Genome Project, I worked at the Department of Energy. Uh, they they led, kind of led that project. I we didn't work on that project, but I was proud that the Department of Energy did that. Um, yeah, that was kind of, I think that blew a lot of people away because I think for a long time people. Could just say, oh, you're so different from me, or you you can't be the same. Yeah, and it's like no. In no. God's eyesight, we are all one. We are all one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and, and 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 also then the everybody needs to be careful that they when they they um well, you've seen that commercial where the guys dance. I think he's dancing in a kilt because he's so Irish. Yeah. And then he, then he, at the end he's <laughs> eating paninis or something, and he's, he, you know it's like I thought I was Irish. So if you if you really believe your what your ancestors told you or your your, your living your living um, ancestors, and you want to keep with that, that's fine. But if you want to prove that that's true, you need to you well you just need to be prepared for maybe surprise. Well, and I want to add on to that too. Yes, ma'am. If your grandparents are here, you sit down. And this is one thing I, I feel oh. bad about. You sit down and get that recorder and have these conversations with them. 
had this oral conversation with them because some of the things that my grandmother shared with me, I confirmed them. But some of the things, I had to reconfirm them, if that's a word. So have these conversations with your grandparents, your descendants, your aunts, your great aunts, your great uncles, and you write that information down. So when you go take your DNA test, you can say, you know what, grandma was right. Granddaddy, he twisted it a little bit, but it's, it's some, some realness to what he shared with us. Right now, in this day and time, I'm telling you, tomorrow's not promised. Have these conversations with your family members. Then that way you can go ahead and move forward in your genealogy research. I do think, just an observation to, to your question, I do think it's interesting to notice that when you're doing the DNA, you're noticing, um, you're noticing where your blood is from, and we're mostly using place names for where your your people come from and then uh in american parlance we're using color words uh so there's it, there's some transition in the way we talk about people from being from different places to being different colors that's right and uh and i just think that that's uh, an interesting thing not a uniquely american thing but it points to the uh education and healing yet to yet to come uh, where where we can see people coming from places, um, but here they're reduced to the color of their skin. That's right. Well, and I think the one, oh no, you, you were waiting to ask the question. Please stop. We'll change direction a little bit, so if you want to finish the question. No, you know, go ahead. I'm going to challenge your claim that there's a certain slave Okay. That is a very common claim made throughout the Everybody in the back hear that about the, uh, the he's saying that he's saying that um, nails. If you look at the nails in the building that's on this the church property, um, they look like uh, 20th century nails. They don't look like nails, and so you can sometimes tell the age of a building by the, whether the nails were handmade or not. Oh, the level of carpentry, the, yeah. the level of joining, all of carpentry and joining. Make an analysis yeah. of the building. Yeah. So this is so much trouble. Evidence of. Thank you. We uh, we learned about that from the family whose farm it is, and so. Uh, but and I wasn't around when that research was done. Uh, I'm not blaming you. No, no, no. I don't feel blamed. Uh, I look forward to learning more. Uh, so uh, it's it's been uh, a few years ago. There was an effort to restore it, and in that restoration process, it was connected with historic slave dwelling projects in, in the U.S. So um, there has been research done. I've, I've only been here a year and there's a pandemic in the middle of it, so I haven't read all of it yet. So, uh, but I look forward to learning more about that. I and I wish- I have a book for you. Okay, great. The book is called Reconstruction, The Second American Revolution. It took place from 1863 to 1863. That book can take you a long time to read. He's recommending the book Reconstruction. A, it is a wonderful, History of that period of Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've got one more question. I think, I think so. Did you have a question, dear? Um, I was just going to ask about uh, Naylor Road. Um, can you tell us where it went? In Fairfax? Yes, near okay. Central. Okay. Yeah. So remember in the beginning of our discussion, uh -huh. I mentioned that the Naylors came from Fairfax. Right. But if you do the boundary back then, Fairfax was actually Prince William. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So that's why you have Nella Rose. And I'm going to surprise you guys with something. I have some cousins that said, oh no, the Nellas from Fairfax County are not the same Nellas. They're not related to the Nellas from Prince William County. Guess what? <laughs> the DNA test. <laughs> <laughs> and like guess more what perfect. I did? Spit the tube. <laughs> guess what I did? Hey! <laughs> Guess what? The Nellas from Fairfax County, quote unquote Prince William County, are the cousins. Wow. Are the same are the cousins to the Nellas from Liberia, Prince William County. So that is good. And, really the, and, good. and the Rose, Nella Rose, my cousin, I hope you're listening. Her father, her mother, her, her mother, I, I believe her mother's name was Mary Nella, because she married her father was a Nella. Benjamin Nella was her father. Mary Nella was her mother. Her mother was very active. Getting that rose, Nella Rose name after the Nella family. Because it's all for Nella Road and four posts, four yeah. my posts. See, I know, I told y'all know. So that's so they are the same family. Yeah. If you go down that road, Crystal Gaskins. If you go down that road, that's my other cousin. If you go down that road, there is a cemetery that some Nellas are buried in. Robinson, Harris, a whole nother lineage. It's in Fairfax County, and that's the Club Run Cemetery. Mm -hmm. That's all, that's another part, because remember I said, Wim Ware and his wife, Harriet Bladen Mitchell Ware, which is a descendant of the Carter family, they were there, Prince William County, slash Fairfax County, they were there before they came here. Because they had land there as well. But once this land was granted to them, they said, hey, and then they bought a branch, they bought some important enslaved people with them, and they brought them with them here. They brought them here with them, and then they left. They split the family and left the others over there. So that's why we are quote unquote cousins. Thank you. You're welcome. You wanted to say something before my oh, last question? You know, I was I was just gonna harken back on. Make sure you use that microphone. Sorry. No, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're one. You, take your time. Bob Marmon. <laughs> um, yeah, I was gonna harken back to what you said about the the the, uh, the slave quarters at. at um, at Mount Vernon, um, there was a um, even in cast in just the first couple of chapters. There was a, a, a sentence that said, "Americans are loath to talk about enslavement in part because of what little we know about it. The little we know about it goes against our perception of our country as a just and enlightened nation, a beacon of democracy for the world, um, and that people are definitely they've been entitled for so many years that they don't they they don't want it, they don't want." They can't imagine that it wouldn't have been kind of like that. Yeah. So there's, it's it's ingrained. I don't know what's the right word. Ingrained. Ingrained in us to to present it. it well, it, we must have been kind of nice to them. Mm -hmm. And you know, they always show the blankets and the and all that. And you know, I mean, it just probably some places were probably better than others. But um, and I think I think um, my understanding. I haven't been to Monticello in a long time, but right after Fawn Brody's book came out. Um, I was, uh, well, I, 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 I'm not a troublemaker, but I mentioned Sally Hemings when I was down there, and they, they, they threatened to call the guard to escort me out, <laughs> but that was a long time ago. Um, and, uh, that must be your Carter DNA. In you yeah, I, I, I was way yeah, before yeah, I knew yeah, about yeah. my Carter DNA, and I didn't say anything nasty. I just asked about Sally Hemings, and they, you know, that word was like, you know, yeah. you've got, you know, do, do you need to leave the tour? And now apparently they've got, uh, you know, they, they, they've acknowledged it. And they've got sections. I don't know. Some people have probably been out there. They're very open about it. But what changed it, Miss Colleen? What changed it? What changed their perception of, of the Well, uh, spin, the the spin, spin the tube. Spin the tube. Spin the tube. Yeah. 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 Science. Yeah. So my last curiosity is imagine we have a time machine and it's, it's Sunday dinner at Liberia House. And you two have received an invitation to attend, and uh, and you walk in the house. What do you say to the folks that are here? Well, are they? What, so they're your they're your relatives. So who, who are they? They wouldn't so, invite me. <laughs> they wouldn't invite know. me. So I don't know. Use your imagination. Way, okay. Way back then. Way back then. What year? Give us a year. Um, after the Civil War, before the Civil give War. Give us a year. Give us a year. Because the little house doing the Civil War. Okay. <laughs> so just after the Civil War. <laughs> okay. And they when, said, the, when the nailers have been honored for the like, they've take, taken care of the house. Oh. And uh, and so so maybe maybe they're they're all in the same building around dinner time on on Sunday. 
You know what? I'm, I'm going to be honest. What do you I love say? me a Sunday meal. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, you dress a different type of way for a Sunday meal. Uh -huh. You have different type of conversations on Sunday. Uh -huh. So I can imagine me coming in and saying, hey, you know, of course you have to, they, they talk to different people. I think they use the word perhaps and, and so forth. <laughs> so you have a different uh, a dialect, a different language. Uh -huh. You have your English uh -huh. uh, language. So, of course, I would come, because you told me to be, you told me to be Creative, sure, right? yeah, I'm so with I'm you. In, and of course, I would have my fine jewelry on. I would have my hair somewhat like this, but they did wear, you know, little hair extensions and stuff. So I would have the same, pretty much I'd be the same way. And they wouldn't have invited me. I and they wouldn't, how do you know? I, you would have came as my guest. I'm yeah. saying they asked for you, like oh. some powers that be, okay, asked for you two to show up. And what do you th what do you say to the folks that are there? First of all, we want to say thank you for inviting us, right? Because this is a very, <laughs> this is a very, house. This is a very yeah. important house. Yeah. No, everybody's not invited, right? But, 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 but I wonder if they would know that I was a Carter descendant and that, 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 that if it were back in 1850, then it's not that far from when I was, when my... But you don't tell them the part that you're the Carter descendant that... Oh, I thought they would know that. No, but oh. the, the other part about um, your ancestors freeing the slaves, so they may be like, hey, wait a minute, because it may be still a little bit of tension in there. Well, I'd have to be careful. you got to be careful. Yeah, That's yeah. Right. Because, and I could see... I could see if they say, oh, this is, because back then that might have been the great, great granddaughter of the, their, of the, the, their families right. of slavers. They, right. they might not say, oh, great, you know, sit down. I still might have been, especially if it was before the Civil War, even after the Civil War, I might not have, I might have been persona non grata. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> you know what I would ask them, to be honest, women? I would ask them about their beauty. I, I, I honestly would ask them about, I know that sounds but I would ask them about their beauty secrets. How did they maintain their beauty secrets? And I asked them, I would also ask them the most important question, how did you make it through? Because mm -hmm. I know these lands right here, they saw some body on the mm -hmm. They saw some other activities on the plane. You know, Nellie Naylor, uh, it was Bridget Somewhere that she served ice cream to Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. You know, those things right there, I would ask them, how was it? That's the, out of all the people I would talk, I would have a conversation with. Yeah, if I were asked in that capacity, then I would love to know the history and what it was like and, yeah. and all of that. I just didn't know how much your invitation was going to tell them about <laughs> me and if they would accept me. And I think I would be understanding if they didn't accept me. Yeah, and I would keep my invitation in some type of a, uh, uh, a book, a little scrapbook, yeah. and I would, keep, I would still have my invitation. I would be bragging about it to my descendants today. And so then, the, the last follow-up question is then, imagine six, seven, eight generations from now. Yes. When you think about them, uh, if you could talk to them, what, what would you say to them? Or what do you hope that, what do you hope is true for them by that time? Maybe the term Black Lives Matter. Yeah, I think please read, please Thank learn, <laughs> please, please open your minds, open your hearts, figure, think about the history of this country, and I think the the paradox between what the Constitution says and what we really what we really did, what what, we, what we're still doing, um, you know, I'm hopeful that six, what did you say six generations? Sure. That's a long time from now. Yeah, yeah, I'm hopeful that that we're in a completely different space. I'm not cons I'm not con convinced that there will be the United States as we know it, um, based on things that are going on now. I think it's, it, it might be hard, and there might be divisions of people. One, who believe one way, believe a different way. But um, six generations. My husband was asking me this morning, is a generation 20 years? And yeah, it's 20 years if I have a baby at 20 and they have a baby at 20. But really, six generations back is way back for me. So we're really talking about like, what, 2200 or yeah. 2300 or yeah. something? So it's hard, it's hard for me to say, but I'm hopeful that they're in a better situation, at least about the, 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 injustice, the rate, racial injustice than than we are now. Yeah. What about you? What would you say? Pretty much she said it. Um, yeah, because right now, what I'm praying, I'm praying, and I, I'm sure I have a, you guys are praying as well, is that we won't continue to see this racial inequality cycle uh, uh, continue on. Uh, that, and that we see just six generations. We may have just a, I'm, I'm praying that we have a sprinkle of it, but hopefully during this, during this generation, we will see
stories and um, and also just witnessing your relationship uh, that's that's been a blessing for me and uh, and a gift and and continues to kind of fan the flames of some of that hope uh, and just to know some more of the history of this place I'm also thankful to to Manassas City and the historic group uh, and parks for putting this together um, but but especially to you two uh, thank you very much will you join me in thanking you Thank you guys. Yeah. And let me stop. We look on Facebook. <laughs>